Hello everyone, today we will talk about surfaces with zero gauss curvature and comparison geometry in general. The main result we will discuss today is the following. If sigma is a proper surface with zero gauss curvature, then it is a cylinder. That means there is a line L such that for each point P in sigma, the line parallel to L passing through P is entirely contained in sigma, meaning that sigma is a union of parallel lines. We present a proof by Sergei Ivanov, but historically this theorem was originally proven by Pogorelov in 1956. More general results have been obtained, for example, by Hartmann Nuremberg and Massey. I'll leave the references in the description. For this proof, we will denote by A the set of points where the shape operator doesn't vanish. Remember that the shape operator at each point is diagonalizable with orthogonal eigenspaces. And since the Gauss curvature is zero everywhere, then at each point at least one eigenvalue of the shape operator is zero. The first part of the proof consists of showing that for each P in A, there is a line segment passing through P contained in A, and that this segment is unique in the sense that any other segment with this property will span the same line. For P in A, by continuity, there is a neighborhood of P where the shape operator doesn't vanish. Then at each x in that neighborhood, one eigenvalue of s is zero and the other one doesn't vanish. The corresponding eigenspaces give an orthogonal decomposition of Tx sigma that changes smoothly from point to point. This allows one to construct the chart s with s of zero equals p, s u in the kernel of s, and s v in the other eigenspace. Also, we can arrange that s u has norm one along the axis v equals zero. The construction of this chart is a consequence of the general existence theory of ODEs and it leave it to you as an exercise. In this coordinate system, let x be the unit vector in the direction s u, y the unit vector in the direction s v, and n the Gauss map. Notice that at each point, the vectors x, y, and n form an orthonormal basis. By the definition of the shape operator, n u is zero, and n v equals minus k s v, with k the normal curvature in the direction y. We now check that each vector x, y, and n does not depend on u. By our choice of chart, n u is zero. We then differentiate this with respect to v and get k s v u is also zero. From the definition of y, s v is its norm times y. We then apply the product rule with respect to u. This last expression has a component in the direction of y and the component in the direction y u. Now remember that the derivative of a unit vector is always perpendicular to the original vector, meaning that yu is perpendicular to y. Therefore, the component corresponding to yu in this expression is zero. From our hypothesis, k doesn't vanish in this neighborhood, and since s is a chart, sv is also not zero. This implies that yu is zero. Finally, x is plus minus the cross product of y and n, so its derivative with respect to u is also zero by the product rule. This concludes the proof that the vectors x, y, and n do not depend on u. Then x, the direction of the curve s of u, 0, doesn't depend on u. This implies that this curve is actually a line, proving the first part of the lemma. To prove the second one, assume there is another line segment gamma containing sigma and passing through p. Of course, we can parameterize gamma by arc length. We then write gamma prime at 0 in terms of x and y. Then the normal curvature of gamma at p equals beta squared k, but the normal curvature of gamma can also be computed as the dot product between n and the acceleration of gamma, so this curvature is zero. By hypothesis, k is not zero at p, so beta is zero. This means that gamma is parallel to x, finishing the proof of the lemma. The next step is to prove that k satisfies an interesting equation. It turns out that 1 over k changes linearly with respect to u. By the product rule, the second derivative of this quotient equals minus 1 over k squared times k u u minus 2 k prime squared over k, so it is enough to show that the term on the right is zero. Before we do that, we first need to show that s u u is zero. From the product rule and the fact that x doesn't depend on u, we get that s u u is a multiple of x. In particular, it is perpendicular to s v. We then differentiate the norm of s u squared with respect to v. This equals twice s u v dot s u. By the product rule, this also equals twice the derivative of sv dot su with respect to u minus sv dot su u. We just proved that the second term is zero, and the first term is zero because the eigenspaces of the shape operator are orthogonal. This shows that the length of su doesn't depend on v. Remember that by construction, the length of su was also constant along the axis v equals zero, so the length of su is constant along the entire chart. 
By differentiating this with respect to u, we conclude that the dot product between SUU and SU is zero. Since SUU was a multiple of SU, this shows that SUU is zero. Finally, NVU equals zero, and by our choice of coordinates, NV equals minus KSV. Then by the product rule, KUSV plus KSUV is zero. From here, we deduce that SUV equals minus KUSV over K. We put this aside and differentiate again NVU with respect to U. By the product rule, we get KUUSV plus twice KUSUV plus KSUUV. Before, we proved that SUU is zero, and we can substitute SUV to get KUUSV minus 2KU squared over KSV. The fact that this coefficient vanishes is exactly what we needed to show that 1 over k changes linearly with respect to u. Now let gamma of t be the line that contains the segment s of t, 0. We claim that if sigma is proper, then gamma is fully contained in A and so in sigma. Recall that a surface being proper means that it is a closed subset of R3. Assume by contradiction that it doesn't. Since we can revert the orientation of gamma, we can assume that there is t greater than 0 with gamma of t not in A. Now let uppercase t be the supremum of t for which gamma of u is in A for u in the interval 0 t. The first case to consider is when gamma of t is in A. Then by the first lemma, there is a segment in sigma containing A passing through gamma of t. By the uniqueness of this segment, it must be an extension of gamma. This will contradict the maximality of t. The second case is when gamma of t is not in A. Now since gamma is proper, gamma of t is in sigma, and since it is not in A, the shape operator at gamma of t is zero. Now we have a problem. In the second lemma, we prove that provided gamma of t remains in A, 1 over k changes linearly with respect to t, so it cannot blow up in finite time. Therefore, k cannot vanish in finite time. This contradicts the fact that the shape operator at gamma of t is zero. I'll say that again because it is a very unique argument. 1 over k changes linearly with respect to t. This means this quantity cannot just suddenly blow up to infinity nor minus infinity, which is exactly what would happen if k approaches zero. So, what we have shown is that for each p in A, there is an entire line L of p passing through p and fully contained in A. Also by the first lemma, this line is unique. For the second part, we will need a general proposition involving the exponential map. Consider a complete surface sigma, Kate's Gauss curvature, p in sigma, and the exponential map x from tp sigma to sigma. Assume R0 is such that the differential dx is injective at each point in the ball of radius R0 around 0 in Tp sigma. Then if k is non-positive, the differential dx is non-contracting at each point in the ball, and if k is non-negative, the differential dx is non-expanding at each point. This will turn out to be just another consequence of the Jacobi equation. Before going into the proof of this proposition, we recall that polar coordinates on a plane induce two vector fields, partial r and partial theta, that look like this. At each point, the length of partial theta is exactly r, so if we consider the vector field 1 over r times partial theta, we obtain a unit vector field that winds around the identity. Let's put this on the side and go to our proposition. Let u be the rectangle in the r theta plane given by 0 r 0 times minus pi pi and set up a coordinate system in which p is the origin and tp sigma is the xy plane. Then let s be the map from u to sigma given by the composition of the polar coordinate map with the exponential map. By our hypothesis, the map s is non-singular, so the Jacobi equation holds. Remember that if we denote by b the length of s theta, then brr plus kb equals zero. We proceed to compute the behavior of b as r goes to zero. For simplicity, we will write b of r for b of r comma zero. By definition, b of r over r is the length of dx of partial theta at r comma zero over r. Since dx is linear, this coincides with the length of dx of partial theta at r comma zero over r. As we noticed before, partial theta at r comma zero over r is a unit vector tangent to tp sigma, and as r goes to zero, this unit vector converges to the unit vector at tp sigma in the direction of the y-axis. And we know that the derivative of the exponential map at the origin is the identity, so this length is precisely one. This tells us that b of r behaves like r as r goes to zero. We now work on the case k non-positive. By the Jacobi equation, b u u is non-negative, meaning that b is convex. 
we claim that b of r is at least r along the interval 0, r0, r0. Why? Assume that this was not the case. Then b of xi is less than xi for some xi. Then by convexity, the limit of b of r over r as r goes to 0 will be strictly less than 1. The above analysis was for theta equals zero, but it works for any direction, meaning that b of r comma theta is greater or equal than r for any theta. This means that the length of the exp of partial theta is always greater or equal than the length of partial theta. Now let b be any tangent vector to tp sigma in the ball of radius r zero around the origin. If v equals alpha partial r plus beta partial theta, then its length squared equals alpha squared plus beta squared r squared, which by our previous observations is less or equal than alpha squared plus beta squared times the length of bx partial theta squared. By the Gauss lemma and the Pythagoras theorem, this equals the length of dx of alpha partial r plus beta partial theta. This is precisely what we wanted to show when k is non positive. The proof for when k is non negative is almost identical. From the Jacob equation, b u u is non-positive, so b is concave and b of r is always less or equal than r along the interval 0 r 0. Otherwise, b of xi is greater than xi for some xi. Then by concavity, the graph of b lies above the line with slope 1. This will imply that the limit of b of r over r as r goes to 0 is greater than 1, which is impossible. The rest of the proof is the same as before, just with inequalities reversed. It turns out that in the case of non-positive curvature, one can bootstrap the hypothesis from the conclusion. That is, if sigma is a proper surface of non-positive curvature and p is in sigma, then d x is injective at all points of t p sigma. This can be checked by a simple argument. Assume the conclusion fails and let r1 be the largest radius for which d x is injective at all points of the open ball of radius r1 around 0. Then use the proposition we just proved to check that the exp is injective at all points in a slightly larger ball, contradicting the maximality of R1. From here, it is also not hard to check that exp is a covering map from TP sigma to sigma. This is also known as the Cartan Hadamard theorem. Now we turn back to our proper surface sigma with zero curvature. Take P in sigma. Since the curvature is non-positive, the exponential map is a covering map and its differential is non-contracting at each point. Since the curvature is non-negative, the differential of the exponential map is also non-expanding at each point. Therefore, the exponential map is a local isometry from the tangent plane to the surface sigma. Then for each x in tp sigma with x of x in A, we know there is a unique line L of x of x passing through x of x and fully containing A. We can leave this line to tp sigma via the exponential map, and since it is a local isometry, this line is lifted to a line passing through x, which we call L tilde of x. If we do the same with another point y in tp sigma with x of y in a, we get another line L tilde of y in tp sigma now passing through y. Notice that these lines are parallel, because if not, they will intersect at a point z, and then, when we take x of z, it will be a point in A with two distinct lines passing through it, but that was ruled out by the uniqueness of the first lemma. This shows that in tp sigma, the preimage of A is a union of parallel lines that get sent via the exponential map to lines in the three-dimensional space. We now claim that these lines in the three-dimensional space are also parallel. To see that, assume that two of them are not. Pick a point A tilde in one of the corresponding lines in tp sigma and B tilde in the other one. Because the exponential map is a local isometry, the distance between their images in the three-dimensional space is not longer than the distance between them in the tangent plane. But if we move these two points together to infinity, the distances between them remains constant, but the corresponding points in R3 move in different directions, so the distance between them goes to infinity, and this is a contradiction. What we have shown is that there is a line L in R3 such that for all x in A, the line parallel to L passing through x remains in A. We can check by continuity that the same is true in the boundary of A. That is, if y is in the boundary of A in sigma, then there is a sequence of points xn in A converging to y. Then the lines L of xn converge to the line parallel to L passing through y, and since sigma is proper, this limit line also belongs to the surface. And we're almost done here. 
we know that A is a union of parallel lines, and each connected component of the complement consists of a flat strip between two parallel lines. This is because if the shape operator is identically zero on a region, then such region has to be contained in a plane. You can check this directly from the definition of the shape operator. This finishes the proof of the theorem. And that's it for today. Have a good one, folks.